that the universe is expanding is one of humanity's monumental discoveries. Starting from something infinitesimally small, the universe has become something majestically large. How could this happen? What could this mean? Toing and froing in our daily lives, most people never think about the expanding universe. I think about it all the time. Why? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth explains why. I start by getting the best current thinking on how the universe expands. And that means going to MIT to see Alan Guth, whose theory of cosmic inflation revolutionized cosmology. Alan, the term Big Bang is in popular parlance. Everybody sort of knows it and talks about it. But there's imprecision in what that really means. What uh, does it mean? Uh, to some people, the word Big Bang means the instant of creation. Mm -hmm. And it really, surprisingly, in spite of the name Big Bang, really says nothing about the Big Bang itself. It says nothing about what banged, why it banged, or what happened before it banged, I like to say. So the Big Bang theory is really the theory of the aftermath of a bang. Uh -huh. uh, and it's a theory that describes the expansion of the early universe, assuming that it started in a very hot, dense state. It assumes that all the particles are already present and that they have already been set into motion. And the theory then describes how the universe expands, cools, describes how the early chemical elements formed, how eventually the stars formed. There's a lot in the theory, uh, but it does not describe the bang itself. A twist called inflation that I've worked on attempts to describe the bang of the Big Bang, uh, the thing that caused the universe to propel into this gigantic expansion that we still see the aftermath of. Uh, today. So what is inflation? How does it work? And I might slightly correct you in that you created it in addition <laughs> to working on it. <laughs> inflation uh, is based uh, on ideas coming out of particle physics, uh, which tell us that our theories predict that at very high energies, there should actually exist forms of matter uh, which turn gravity on its head and cause gravity to behave repulsively instead of attractively. And the inflationary theory is basically the hypothesis that this repulsive gravity was the bang of the Big Bang. It's what set the universe into this period of gigantic expansion. The gravitational repulsion leads to an exponential expansion, which means that there's a certain time in which the universe doubles, and if you wait the same length of time, it doubles again, and then doubles again. How much time uh, do you have to wait? Not too uh, much. Not too much. <laughs> uh, to uh, get the universe from the size that we think it had at the beginning of inflation to what it needs to have had at the end of inflation, to ultimately include everything that we see, uh, requires about 100 doublings. Mm -hmm. These doublings happen unbelievably quickly using the physics of what particle physicists call grand unified theories. Then the doubling time was about 10 to the minus 37 seconds, decimal point, 36 zeros, wow. one at the very wow. end. Unbelievably short length of time. So if you have 100 of these, it takes 10 to the minus 35 seconds. That's absolutely right. 100 of them makes 10 to the minus 35 seconds. So in this uh, period still an of time, unbelievably short length of time. the whole universe as we know it was created. Essentially, that's right. Uh, inflation is not a theory of the ultimate creation of the universe right. in that to start inflation one needs a little bit of matter, approximately a gram, it turns out. But once you have this gram, inflation actually does describe how all the rest of the matter that we see, which of course is vastly more than a gram, uh, is created. Absolutely Now, right. it sounds like we're getting something for nothing because how can you have energy being created when we know there's a very tight law of conservation of energy and matter? It does sound amazing, and I sometimes refer to the inflationary creation of the universe as the ultimate free lunch. So we have this exponential expansion, and it ends because this repulsive gravity material is unstable, so it starts to decay into normal forms of matter and releases energy in the process. And it's that release of energy uh, that becomes the energy of the universe that gets produced. The shocking thing 
is that even though total energy is always conserved, one has an instinct to believe that energies are always positive, so that to have a lot of energy in some place, you need to have started out with a lot of energy someplace. That's what falls by the wayside. Inflation takes advantage of a fact, which has really been part of physics for a long time, uh, that not all energies are positive. Mm. And in particular, the gravitational field has a negative contribution to the total energy of whatever system it's part of. So as inflation goes on, more and more positive energy goes into the creation of matter of various kinds, uh, but at the same time, more and more negative energy is created in the form of this gravitational field that just fills the ever-expanding region of space. And they balance. So the total energy remains what it was when you started, which was very, very close to zero. Mm. Uh, and shockingly, it really is consistent when we look at it our observed universe uh, that the total energy in stars and galaxies and vast amounts of matter that we see uh, throughout the observed universe is canceled by the negative contribution of wow. the gravitational field that fills the universe. Now, so the total energy of our universe is consistent with being zero. Now, all of this matter then is created at the end of inflation. That's right. Uh, it's created what? in the form of this repulsive gravity material as inflation goes on, right. and but then, becomes normal matter right, uh, right, right. at the end of inflation. Okay. Cosmic inflation is what makes the Big Bang go bang, creating energy and matter in Alan's ultimate free lunch. One gram of this very special matter generates the entire universe. I do understand inflation, but still I have trouble believing it. It's so incredible. That's the word. Now, digging deeper into how the expansion works, I head off to Princeton to ask Paul Steinhardt, a leading cosmologist who helped develop inflation theory. How does the nature of space affect the expansion? Paul, one of the great achievements of human understanding was the discovery that our universe is expanding. All right. And it is such a, an awe-inspiring concept when we really understand what that means. But how do we get into that question? Up until Einstein's work in the earlier part of this 20th century, the idea was that space is something that we move through, but is itself static, inert. So we can talk about our position in it, uh, how fast we move through it, but the space itself doesn't respond to anything else that's happening. It's a separate entity. After Einstein invented his special theory of relativity, which described the way space and time uh, change as, uh, according to different observers, uh, he discovered he, with, that if that theory is right, he had to revise the theory of gravity. And his revised theory of gravity says that space is not something which is inert. Space is something which is elastic. It can stretch, it can warp, it can wiggle. And then that opens up a possibility that it's not just fixed, but it's actually changing its shape and curv curvature and warps with time. And Einstein's theory allowed that as well. So you immediately ran into a, even a more elementary problem, which is if the universe is expanding going forward in time, what's going to happen going backwards in time? It will have contracted. And um, eventually it will have contracted to a point where everything we see, uh, all the matter and radiation space, will have contracted to a point. Uh, that means the temperature and density would have become infinite, and space would have, in some sense, disappeared, according to Einstein's mm -hmm. theory. Uh, this is what we call the Big Bang, or the cosmic singularity. And so it immediately introduced a very uncomfortable idea that space and time have a beginning, which is something I know Einstein wasn't very happy with and many people aren't uh, happy with. Uh, and then it led to a second problem, which is, okay, if we imagine it has a beginning and this is some violent quantum event, then what comes out of this event should be something turbulent. It should be very non-uniform. It should be hotter in one direction than another. But the universe doesn't look that way at all. The universe looks remarkably uniform, and space seems hardly warped at all. So the moment we had the idea of a beginning, it turns out we had to invent a new idea to explain the smoothness that would emerge right after the beginning. 
So this has forced us logically into, well, the only solution we know if the universe has a beginning is to have a period that we call inflation. The way the inflationary theory developed historically is that uh, Alan Guth at MIT first of all had the idea that if you had this kind of self-repulsive energy, it could cause the universe to smooth itself out. But once it began this process of inflation, he didn't have any mechanism to stop it. So the universe just had this runaway inflation forever. The way I got into the game was seeing I could improve this idea and finding a way to make this self-repulsive energy to decay. So we, in fact, uh, along with a student, uh, Andy Albrecht, we, in fact, found a mechanism to, to, that would permit it to decay. And so the universe could then be smooth and then end inflation. You know, most cosmologists would be saying, yes, and, and the wonderful agreement between observation and theory really gives me complete confidence that the inflationary theory is right. I'm a, one of the rare exceptions who's been questioning that claim lately by thinking about alternative ways of creating the same effect. But it's certainly extremely impressive. That inflation solves cosmology problems is remarkable. But getting this self-repulsive energy to decay, end inflation, and begin the universe as we know it, that was Paul's contribution. But a huge surprise was lying wait. The expansion of the universe is accelerating, not slowing down, as everyone expected. Cosmologists were dumbfounded. I must go to Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory to speak with the astrophysicist who discovered the surprise, Saul Perlmutter, who leads the Supernova Cosmology Project. Saul, what is it about the expansion of the universe that's so compelling? I mean, I think the expansion of the universe raised it allowed us to ask these really fundamental philosophical questions that I thought were just fun. I mean, how could you get a better question than, you know, will the universe last forever? Once you learned that the universe was getting larger and larger and all distances were getting greater, you found yourself asking things like, well, will that keep on happening? And if it could go that way, couldn't it go the other way? And what would happen if someday it stopped getting bigger and started getting smaller? Could it collapse and you could have an end to the universe? And that was something you could go out and find out. Has it been slowing down in the past and has it been slowing down enough to someday come to a halt? If you could, you know, if you could weigh the universe and find out how much stuff there was out there, you could find out, you know, is it going to slow to the point that it comes to a halt and then collapses? And it's practical because you can actually go out and look to see how much has the universe been slowing down and find out you know, how much stuff there must be in the universe to be causing that stuff. I mean, here you're saying this very ordinary, you're, you're, you know, you're a normal person sitting here on a bench in a simple building, and you're talking about weighing the universe. I mean, do you even understand the words <laughs> that you're saying? You're talking about weighing the whole universe. You know, physicists in general just love the, the idea that you can ask something that seems philosophical, and you can just go out and, and, and make a practical, simple measurement. And the result that you got when you weighed the universe? When we went out, when we actually did the measurement and we saw what the results told us, it wasn't that the universe was slowing down a little bit but was never going to come, come to a halt. It wasn't that the universe was slowing enough so that someday it would come to a halt and then collapse. It was none of the above. The universe wasn't slowing at all. It was actually speeding up. And that, was, and that was really a shock. Which seemed to contradict the simple physics that if you have stuff in the universe, it'll, gravity will slow everything down. That's right. I suppose you were seeing there, you know, tossing an apple in the air and catching it and tossing it in the air and you know, seeing gravity pull it back down again. And you tossed it and just blast it <laughs> off. You know, it had a little bit of that feel to it. That you were, it didn't fit you know, okay. with what we thought we were dealing with. So if you had used the current rate of expansion that we see today um, and you had guessed what it was back in the past, um, you obviously got the answer wrong. It must have been slower in the past in the expansion than it is today, and that's an acceleration. And what is the significance of this? Well, apparently, there's something that we had not accounted for in our physics that's driving the universe still, that's making it expand faster and faster. We are calling this, this energy that must pervade <laughs> all in space, we're just using the term dark energy as just a placeholder to describe our ignorance because <laughs> we have no we idea what, what this is. is. Yeah, you know. right. That's why we call it dark. We, just, we, know, we, we know it's energy and we know we don't know right. it. The, dark, so. the darkness <laughs> is in our mind, essentially. <laughs> that, you know, we we, just, we don't, don't know what the right, stuff is. Right, right, right. It, it now becomes one of the most dominant stories of, of, of our picture of the universe. It, uh, you know, in, the, in the most trivial ways of describing it, it would make up 70% of all this stuff, all the energy density in the universe would be in this form. Most of the universe is something that we don't know about. Because of gravity, 
With all the matter in the universe, its rate of expansion was supposed to be slowing down. Shockingly, it is speeding up, apparently forever. How is this happening? So-called dark energy is the reason. It's astonishing. 70% of all the stuff in the universe is this dark energy. With such breathtaking new visions, does new meaning emerge? George Ellis is a renowned cosmologist from South Africa who pioneered dialogue between science and religion. A Templeton Prize laureate, George seeks deep meaning in the expansion of the universe. In the old days when I was a graduate student, which was quite a while ago, it was assumed that as you went beyond the horizon, everything was the same. This was formalized in what was called the cosmological principle, the idea that the universe is completely homogeneous and isotropic, and this continued as far as one could imagine. In fact, people would say it carried on to infinity. Now the idea has changed and people believe that it does continue very much the same beyond where we can see, beyond the horizon, but then at some point there's kind of a giant wall and things are quite different beyond that. And there could be many, many other patches like the patch we see, this expanding universe with hundreds of millions of galaxies, but they would be different in some ways. There would be different physics out there, they might shine differently, have different lifetimes and so on. And that this goes on for infinity is now the current sort of idea. And this is the multiverse where, where each yeah. area of constant physical law is one universe in a multiverse of yeah. who knows infinite. Yeah. No. I, I prefer to call it an expanding universe domain, but people talk them about as universes. In fact, as a cosmologist, to me, the universe is everything that exists. Okay, good. The problem is we can't see those other domains. We, so we can't prove anything about them. Now, there is one option, which is actually a rather nice option. Maybe if this picture is wrong, maybe we are seeing the same patch of space-time over and over again. Now, Einstein's theory allows this to happen because space-time is not only is curved, it can have a different connectivity structure. So maybe we carry out that way for a couple of hundred million light years and then suddenly we return from that side just like Pac-Man did in those computer games. In that case there would be actually many few galaxies than we appear to see. We would be seeing many images, maybe hundreds of images of the same galaxy. This is what I call a small universe. And to me this is philosophically very attractive and that it could be the case. It probably isn't but nevertheless that's a possibility. Why would that be attractive to you? Ah, many reasons. It's because the philosophical re relation of humanity to the universe is completely different. In that case, we have seen everything in the universe. There's nothing unknown out there. In fact, we've seen it many different times. So, for instance, our own galaxy we would see in different directions in the sky at different times of its history. In the standard picture, as we age, which physically, as a cosmologist, we think is moving up our word line in space-time. We're seeing new bits of the universe which we've never seen before. Something totally unexpected could happen. Maybe there could be a huge wall suddenly come into view emitting gravitational waves. They could be so strong they would destroy the Earth. Okay? <laughs> that, that cannot happen in the case of the small universe because we've seen everything there is. There are no surprises out there ever waiting for us because we've seen all there is. Don't you like surprises? <laughs> Not that way. <laughs> so, so it's just like on this earth, in the old days when Columbus and so on said, oh, we'd only seen a bit of the earth, but then we saw the whole of the surface of the earth. Now, you can still examine in more detail what lies on the surface of the earth, but basically we've seen all the surface of the earth. And that would be the case in a small universe. Some would say that one of the underlying motivations for postulating the multiverse, many different universes, is dealing with the fine-tuning problem yes. that we find in ours. Absolutely. That unless you have a multi-universe, the only other alternative is some sort of a theological answer. I am, as I think is known, of a theistic inclination, but the reason for that is not because of the multiverse and so on. It is partly because of the fine-tuning, because, as you've said, one of the options here is a theistic one. The whole thing was intended to be that way. But because I think if you want to understand the deep nature of the universe, as well as taking into account astronomical observations, you must take other data, and the other data you must take into account 
is the data of everyday life. <laughs> the fact that we exist is something that must be taken into account, but also the kinds of experiences we have. And those experiences include things like apprehensions of beauty, apprehensions of a moral order, and this kind of thing. And I think if you want to argue about the metaphysics of the universe, that is experience which is also relevant in understanding the metaphysics of the universe as well as the astronomical data. George is an increasing rarity, a first-rate scientist who sees marks of theism in the furniture of the heavens. But are there other kinds of meanings? Finally, I go to Stanford to see Andre Linde, one of the world's leading cosmologists, the originator of eternal chaotic inflation. Does Andre see meaning in an expanding universe? Andre, when you take a step back and look at the last 30 years of, of cosmology and human understanding, what are the things that are most important? So just think about this. We are going to see everything that it is there to see about the universe within maybe next uh, 30 years, 50 years. We started doing it maybe 100 or seriously 50 or precisely 30 or more precisely 10 years ago. So all of this is just this minuscule fraction of time. Time less than a century from start to the end. Now, this, compare this to these 14 billion years. So the universe waited for 14 billion years to be observed. And, and, and is observed and now, in that and short... And now, her desire is finally fulfilled. We see her in all of her beauty. And next billion years, we are not going to see anything more because this is just speed of light multiplied by the age of the universe. Can't get more. So we need to wait another, these 14 billion years to double our horizon. So we are living right now in a very special time. What is the probability that we would be born in the time where cosmology would be so exciting? On the other hand, my personal attitude to it is maybe different from a perspective of many other cosmologists. Because, well, you know, physicists, they study things just for the benefit of uh, studying the things, because they are so interesting how the world works. I am looking at the universe sometimes also with this perspective, but sometimes with a different perspective. The universe is our cosmic home. And if I want to know something about our self, okay, something about our life, our death, okay, when you're looking at our universe, maybe it will provide us some cosmic perspective which will tell us eventually something more about us. The whole universe is supposed to emerge from nothing, from this point before which there was nothing at all. Now, however, we study this with the methods of quantum cosmology, which were unavailable before. We use our knowledge of inflationary cosmology, which was unavailable before. We use right now the methods of string theory, which was a different method. Who knows, maybe space-time is not fundamental. Maybe our treatment of this initial singularity was not correct. Some people consider the possibility that our universe emerged from something which was before. So then look at us. We are emerging from what? From nothing, we are born and then we are dying. What was with us before? What is going to happen with us later? Maybe study of cosmology will not tell us anything new about it. Maybe, however, you know, parallels sometimes can teach us something. Maybe by learning something about death and the birth of the universe, maybe we can learn something about ourselves. And this I consider one of the most interesting, well, speculative consequences of study of cosmology. That the universe is expanding is sure. That the expanding universe bears meaning is not. Many cosmologists see no meaning. The universe is a brute fact. It is what it is, and that's all there is. 
But if there is meaning, what kinds of meaning? Multiple universes, which expand all reality beyond imagination? Window into new realities? Theistic fingerprints? Grand harmonies of birth and death between universe and humans? In little more than 100 years, humanity has progressed from virtual ignorance of the universe to be able to see and largely explain the staggering vastness of the cosmos. Of this one thing, I am sure, if there is meaning in the cosmos, the expansion of the universe is a clue, bringing us closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com. <laughs>